For today's keynote, we'll have two 15-minute TED Talk type talks. We'll call them Ed Talks. And they'll give us a glimpse and some insights into how two thought leaders think about the issues of equity and education. So Learning Forward changed its vision, as you heard, a year ago to read equity and excellence in teaching and learning. And when we say equity, we mean for every child to succeed. So the question becomes, what do we expect from high quality professional learning to contribute to that equity and excellence for all? And making sure that the systems reach the needs of every single student. We know that professional learning is a vehicle to decrease inequity in all of our students. So we appreciate that Michael Petrelli and Howard Fuller will join us today to share their insights and inspire a conversation. I'll introduce them both and then after their ed talks, I'll return to moderate a discussion that will include the Missouri Teacher of the Year, Shelly Parks. Anybody from Missouri in the room? <laughs> kind of thought there might be a few of you. So let me start with Michael Petrelli. He is the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and executive director of, or executive editor of Education Next and a distinguished senior fellow at the Education Commission of the States. An award-winning writer, Michael is the author of The Diverse Schools Dilemma and editor of Education for Upward Mobility. Petrelli has published opinion pieces in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg View, and Slate, and is frequently on TV and radio. He serves as an international advisor to Learning Forward. Following Michael's remarks, we'll hear from Howard Fuller. So I first heard Howard Fuller, it was an education, urban education conference in the early 90s, and I was particularly struck by his passion for all of our students, particularly those in the most challenged settings. He is a distinguished professor of education and the founder director of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Previously, Fuller was the superintendent of the Milwaukee Public Schools, where he became nationally known for his unending support for fundamental education reform. Other past roles include Dean of Education at the Milwaukee Technical College and Associate Director of Educational Opportunity Programs at Marquette University. He was also a senior fellow with the Annenberg Institute for School Reform at Brown University. So to start us off with our first Ed Talk, please welcome Michael Petrelli to the stage. All right, hello everybody. I am so excited to be here today, especially because I am back in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. Parkway West 91, baby. All right, who's out there? Anybody? Parkway West, there it is. Uh, so, so great to be with you. Uh, I have such respect for the work that you do around the country, providing support to educators and their learning. You know, there was a time when people just assumed that professional development, as we used to call it, uh, was never going to be fixed, that it didn't do any good and it would never do any good. And you know what? The people in this room came in and you fixed it and you made it better and you now have found ways to support teachers that is making a difference. In just the last year, uh, such important research coming out, I think it was Professor Matthew Kraft at Brown University, showing uh, that coaching, that the kind of coaching that so many of you in this room do, uh, makes a sizable impact on student achievement. Uh, and it's just one, one other sign that things in our system are going in the right way, thanks to the great work you do. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is the direction that our system is going in. Let me ask you a question. We, we heard the NAEP results uh, mentioned before. Let, raise your hand if you read about the nation's report card a few weeks ago about the results uh, that came out nationally. And raise your hand if you read about the international test score results that came out last week from PISA. Uh, I think the New York Times and that one, uh, the headline was, it just isn't working. Decades of reform and yet no progress. And tell me if you have heard some of the comments from our Education Secretary, Betsy DeVos, when she has said uh, that what these results show is that there has been no progress over the last couple of decades, all the reform, all the resources, there's been no progress. Does that ring a bell? Let me ask you a question. Does that ring true to you, that there's been no progress? Does that sound right, that somehow 
all the work that you and your colleagues have been doing, all of the resources and money, all of the political uh, capital that has gone into improving and reforming our schools, that none of that has made a difference. What I'm going to talk about today, what I'm going to try to argue, what I'm going to try to convince you about today is that, in fact, our schools have made progress. Our schools are moving in the right direction. That if you get below those very troubling headlines, the story is much more nuanced. And the nuanced story is that were it not for the great work that you're doing out there in our schools, uh, those results would actually be much worse. And that is because we are facing some very difficult headwinds out there in the lives of children and in families that is having a big impact on what's going on in our schools. I also want to argue that if we pay too much attention to this narrative, to this narrative that is forming, that none of this has mattered, that none of this has worked, that we will risk making a mistake that we have made so many times before in education reform. And then that is to abandon promising efforts just as they're starting to bear fruit, right? And turn the page and go on to something else. We cannot make that mistake again. So I do want to talk about what explains this lack of progress. I'm not Pollyanna. Let's be honest with ourselves that those headline uh, outcomes are disturbing. On the NAEP, in particular, we see mostly flat lines and in some cases some declines in recent years, especially for our lowest performing kids who overwhelmingly tend to be our lowest income kids. That should worry us. You know, I'll, I'll be clear, I'm a policy guy. I like test scores. I, I, I know they don't measure everything that matters, okay? But they do measure skills that do matter for kids' lives. Reading, writing, mathematics, it's not everything. But kids need those basic skills if they're going to have any shot of going on and building those other important skills and going on to post-secondary education, success uh, in career, and to be full participants in our democracy. So these things matter. And, and I do worry when we see trends that are flat or sloping downwards. I obsess about which states are showing progress and which states are not. By the way, in terms of which states are showing progress, anybody here from Mississippi? All right, yes! <laughs> Go Mississippi! Uh, and D.C., anybody here from D.C.? All right, there we go. Uh, a, a couple of the places that, that are beating the curve and still getting results. And the story in both places is so much about professional learning and about bringing the science into instruction. So we should be worried about these results, but we need to understand what's happening here. And, and the argument I want to make is that a lot of what we're seeing is really the devastating impact of the Great Recession. And, you know, sometimes it may feel like that is so far in our rearview mirror, but when we're talking about kids... We know that they grow slowly and that something like living through the Great Recession may be something that's going to stick with them and unfortunately have some pretty negative impacts uh, ongoing. And that may be part of what we're seeing uh, in our results. I also want to say, though, that there are some things that we need to look at soberly from those results and, and try to figure out whether we need to adjust our strategy in some ways going forward. So... We're going to get into some data here. I'm not sure if everybody all the way in the back can see all of this, but, uh, but let me go through just a few slides and I'll describe them in case you can't see them super well. The main thing I want you to take away from this picture is that progress is possible. What this is showing is fourth grade achievement for African American and Hispanic students on the national assessment at the below basic level. Okay, this is, this is the level that basically indicates basic literacy skills. All right. Now, the horrific news is that way back in the early 90s, you look at these numbers, you know, good grief, that we had 70% of black students uh, were below basic in literacy. 70%, almost as high for Hispanic students. What you see, though, is over the course of the 90s and the 2000s and into the 2010s, amazing, remarkable progress. Okay, dramatic progress that has changed lives, that has changed communities. This means that kids today, uh, African-American kids, Hispanic kids, many of our lowest achieving kids, many low-income kids, are now achieving two to three grade levels ahead of where their peers were in the early 90s. This means that we've got dramatically more young people who are at least meeting those basic standards of, of literacy and numeracy 
this is surely one big part of the reason why we've seen our high school graduation rates go up dramatically. This is changing lives and changing communities. Progress is possible. We have done it, okay? It's even more dramatic when you look at math. This is eighth grade math, same picture. Dramatic declines in the number of kids who are not reaching those basic standards. This is good, this is what we wanna see, okay? But when you go back and you try to understand what might explain this, part of the story is that things got better for kids and families outside of schools, all right? And, and of course, we've had this debate forever in education about whether poverty matters. Of course, poverty matters, right? And of course, those social conditions matter. And lo and behold, back in the 90s, things got dramatically better. What this is showing is those top two lines, again, for, are for African Americans and Hispanics. And what it is showing is that child poverty rates, and this particular one that's called the supplemental poverty rate that includes uh, income, but it also includes government programs, it includes the earned income tax credit, that all of these efforts combine to dramatically uh, drive down those rates in poverty for those groups of kids, okay? And that I think if you put those two trends together, what you start to see is that they track one another. That as we drove down the child poverty rates, we also drove down the below basic rates, okay? Now, this context is important because if you start to see at the very end of the, of the story, uh, what we see is that things are starting to go in opposite directions, all right? And the argument here is that uh, these things track each other, but there is a time lag, okay? That the kids uh, that are impacted by something like, you know, the economy getting much better or the economy getting much worse, it surely matters, you know, for kids who are already in school age or middle school or high school, but it seems to matter most for the little kids. It seems to matter most what kind of conditions you were born into, okay? So, in the 90s, as these social conditions improved dramatically, it was the kids who were born into those improving conditions, especially lower income kids, who later showed much stronger achievement once they got to school. There was like a 10 year lag for the fourth graders and like a 13 year lag for the eighth graders. Okay, again, that's important to keep in mind. Now, I have to say, all of this is somewhat a hypothesis. We, you know, we know correlation is not causation. Hard to prove these things, but this sure seems like there is a relationship here. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, what are we seeing most recently on the National Assessment of Educational Progress? This particular chart is looking at eighth grade reading by the different percentile levels. What you see is that over the last 10 years, things have been mostly flat. But the really concerning thing that we're seeing is at the bottom, the, the 10th percentile, the 25th percentile. Those students in the last few times of taking the test are suddenly doing much worse. And it's alarming, you know, that these eighth grade scores are down, uh, you know, going down uh, basically 10 points since they're high. That is a whole grade level. So some of that progress that we made back in the 90s and 2000s, we've now given back over the last 10 years. That should get our attention and that is worrying. The question is what is driving that? And again, uh, my argument is that it is largely the Great Recession. Now, I'm almost sure that those of you in the back can't see this chart, but basically what it is showing is the different slices of cohorts of kids, okay? The different kids, uh, when they took the different tests, the fourth grade NAEP, the eighth grade NAEP, and backing up, you know, what is, when, when were they born? When were they in preschool? When were they kindergartners? What you see is a clear pattern, if you can see it, is a clear pattern where the kids, where you start to see things going south is for kids who were born into the Great Recession, who were young during those very difficult years. I mean, remember, back in 2011, 12, 13, unemployment rate over 9%. I mean, we call it the Great Recession because it was not just a regular economic downturn, it was a calamity. And for low-income families in particular, it was an incredible hardship. And you can imagine, as hard as things always are for kids growing up in poverty, at that time, things were surely especially stressful. And the eighth graders that took that test, again, where we saw this huge decline, especially at the bottom, those kids were toddlers and preschoolers when the Great Recession hit, okay? And then they get, grow up and they go into school in kindergarten, first grade, and that's when the big spending cuts happened. Right, back in 2012, 2013, 2014, the first time in American history that we actually year over year cut education spending in real dollars. And of course, in some places, it was cut by a lot, right? And so these kids faced the double whammy 
of being born into this tough situation and then being going to school in those very critical years, kindergarten, first, second grade, uh, when schools were, were really struggling the most. So that is one part of the story, I believe, is that what we are seeing is that kids who really got off to a very challenging start and now are making their way through schools. Now, one thing this means is that these kids, as they go on, are going to need even more support than ever, right? And we've got to do what we can to help them. The other thing it means, though, is that the kids that follow them, who have grown up in much better conditions once the Great Recession ended, now that spending has come back, the hope is they will start to do better, okay? So when you hear Betsy DeVos say, you know, that, that these trends prove that our schools aren't getting any better, uh, the response is, hold on, let's talk about uh, the context, right? Back in the 90s and 2000s, we had the wind at our back. Social conditions for poor kids were getting better. More recently, we've had real headwinds as conditions got worse. Now they're starting to turn around again. All right. So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's go back. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. Now, some other people have been throwing other ideas out there as well. And it's, an, you know, the, the thing about these test scores, as much as we all lo uh, love data and at, at your local level, you can dig into data and really start to draw some conclusions. At the national level, it's hard. It, you know, we look at these data and we have to make our best guesses. Okay, but many people have been saying, well, what about screens? Is that another possibility? Uh, you know, I, certainly... Those of us with kids, who's, who've got little kids at home? Anybody? Uh, yes. Uh, anybody have teenagers at home? Yes. Anybody teach teenagers or uh, little kids? I mean, we know the phones are everywhere. Uh, and there is this concern that the phones could be having an impact on the, our kids' ability to learn, and especially the phones, uh, that, that all the screen time and the phone use is happening at home. What this chart shows is that, in fact, in recent years, we've seen this very disturbing uptick in screen time for the lowest income kids. Somewhat for other kids, but not nearly as much. Now, it's always been the case that lower income kids tend to be on screens more. And you can understand it's, it's tough if you're, a, you know, a single parent and you're working two jobs and sometimes, you know, the only option is for, uh, you know, your child to be, you know, watching PBS. That, that's probably a better option than other things. But, but what we see in this chart, at least, is that maybe things have gotten even worse. And that's something we should be very worried about. Okay? But there's one more possibility. And it is the thing that we all have the most control over. And it's the big shift that has happened in our schools. That not so long ago, we were focused under the No Child Left Behind years on fairly low standards. And now, under, uh, under the regime associated with Every Student Succeeds Act, we are aiming for a much higher bar. Okay? The reason is, as much as we were excited that we were making progress and getting more kids to those basic levels of literacy and numeracy I talked about a few minutes ago, we knew that wasn't enough, that, that it, it was better than not getting to those standards. But if you actually wanted to be prepared for college and career, we needed to aim a lot higher. Uh, and, and we would look at charts like this. What, what this is showing is that um, the top number is, is the percentage of kids who are going to post-secondary education right away out of high school. It's near 70%. Kids are getting the message to go to college, and they're going. The problem is only about 40% of them are actually ready for college, okay, in, in basic skills of reading and math and writing. And guess what? How many finish college? About 40%. So we knew if we want to get that number up, we have got to dramatically raise our standards. And that is what we did, right? 2010, the Common Core comes in. 2015, you've got Park and Smarter Balanced, and now a big, another set of tests after that. And 2018, under ESSA, new accountability systems. But notice, we have not been doing this for very long, right? This has taken us the better course of this decade to shift the whole system towards aiming towards these higher standards. And most importantly, the work around curriculum and helping teachers teach with those new curriculum. That work is almost entirely brand new because back in 2010, of course, the, the Common Core line curricula didn't exist. It took many years for them to get built. Uh, and it is only in the last few years that we now have, according to education reports, a strong set of Common Core line curricula for teachers to use in the classroom. Now the work is happening, the work that you do to help teachers understand how to use those curricula uh, and how to help kids reach these much higher standards. Okay? So that is the work, implementing the curriculum, implementing the effective professional learning. Uh, but let me finish with this one last thought that we really need to mull over, and I hope maybe in the conversation later we can discuss. 
If you go back and you look at those trends and you say, it looks like things are relatively flat for most kids. It's actually at the very high end, we're seeing a little bit of progress for our highest achieving kids but things are really falling behind for the low achievers. Now, I think that is largely because of the Great Recession, but it could also be that our schools over the last 10 years have been shifting their focus. Under No Child Left Behind, the entire focus was on getting the lowest performing kids to a very low standard. And we made progress against that goal, okay? Then we have shifted now to a different goal, which is let's get many more kids to a much higher standard. And what's interesting is it appears that we may be doing a better job with some of our higher achieving kids getting to those higher standards under the Common Core and the other state standards, right? But are we leaving some of the lowest performers behind? When you, I, I'm sure you hear this all the time in your schools and districts, I hear it all the time everywhere, that educators are really wrestling right now with the work of how do I help kids who are below grade level, who may be three years below grade level, catch up and get to do that grade level work. I know Dr. Santalisa talked about this yesterday. That is the great challenge of our time. We want to get many more kids to these high standards, but we can't leave the low performers behind. We certainly don't want to go back to the no child left behind days, right, where we say, well, let's just lower the standard and let's just focus on just getting kids over a very low bar. But we cannot go back to the era of leaving those children behind either. Thank you very much. So I'm particularly happy to be here. I didn't know I was coming to a Motown concert, so I'm good. <laughs> so um, it is an honor for me to be here. But I have to say that I stand before you all today with two burning issues that are both in my heart and in my soul. Because I believe that our children are our most precious gift from God. And I believe that it is our responsibility with God's guidance to love them, to nurture them, to care for them, and to make sure that every single one of them is educated. But as a black man, there's this thing that's always in my head, in my mind. And it is this vision that on February 1st, 1960, four black students from A&T sit down at a lunch counter and demanded to be served. And here we are in 2019, four black students can sit down at a lunch counter where they're welcome and can't read the menu. And I asked myself, how did this happen in America? How did we allow this to happen in America? And to be honest with you all, I cannot conceive of an America where the children that I get up every day to fight for will ever get true equality, let alone equity. We throw around these words and we talk about it, and we go to these conferences, we have these lunches, we do all of this pontificating, but at the end of the day, y'all know that when you leave here, these kids that were suffering before you came here are gonna be the same kids who are gonna be suffering when you leave here. And at some point in time, the question is, when does that change? And as an unapologetic black man, I believe in what Derek Bell said in his book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. He said that black people will never gain full equality in this country. Even these Herculean efforts we hail as success will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance and white supremacy. This is a hard to accept fact that all of history verifies. We must acknowledge it not as a sign of submission, but as an ultimate act of defiance. So in my mind, 
Those of you who care about the education of poor black and brown children, we must strive to make our schools citadels of defiance. Because in truth, if you educate these kids, it is almost a revolutionary act because these schools were never designed to educate the kids that we're talking about. It was never designed to do what Paulo Freire said in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and that is to prepare kids to engage in the practice of freedom, the transformation of their world. And those of you who are doing that hard work every day in schools, you know that somehow you're going to have to figure out how to make these schools work in a community that doesn't care about the kids in the school. And people say, oh my God, Howard, don't say that. Oh, that's a down statement. No, it's a true statement, man. I don't believe that you can do anything to change anything until you admit what you're trying to change. And in my view, what we're trying to change is not just the schools. We're trying to change a society that the schools function in. And so as a teacher every day, and I want some of you all to know I actually teach at a school, a charter school that I help start. Because I think anybody who runs around like I do, running his or her mouth on a regular basis, ought to at least see a kid every now and then. So, so I do believe that you are doing some of the most difficult work in the world. But it is the work we chose. And so as we go into these schools, the way that we can make these schools better for our kids is I agree with what Paul Tuff talked about in his latest book, Helping Our Children Succeed. Because what he did was he said, look, if you're really going to create a really good school, there's three things that have to happen in that school. And this is from the work of the psychologists, uh, DC and Ryan. And what he said was, the first thing is that when the children walk into your building, they should feel like they belong there. They should feel like this is a place for me. This is a place that cares about me, not just what kind of test score I get, but this is a place that cares about me. This is a place that I belong. The second thing is that we ought to give our children some sense of autonomy, man. I've gone into these schools, man. I've visited schools all over the country. And you walk into some schools for poor black and brown kids, and it's like walking into a military establishment or a jail. We got them all lined up, walk across this line, because we don't know how to develop relationships with these kids, so we try to control them. I went into a school, man, where they told kids they couldn't talk at lunch. Who the hell comes up with this? Who, who sat in a room and decided that this was a good thing? that kids should not talk at lunch. If you come to our school, man, like lunchtime is lit. Cause like, they just got through dealing with us for a few hours and you tell them not to talk? Hell, you gotta let them explode, man, in order to be able to like, get back to trying to be cool. Because you know, one of the things that's really interesting is now that some of you all done become sedity or bougie or whatever it is, Y'all forgot a lot of y'all were knuckleheads, you know, when you were in school. And now you're trying to take the joy out of being young, man. One of the beauties of being young is to do stuff that shocks adults. That's a part of the description of being a kid, man, is to do some stuff that you say, oh, my God. And the reality is our kids today, they don't go from one to two to four, to six, to 10, they go from one to 10, all within a matter of seconds. Any of y'all who are dealing with kids every day know that. 
but yet we still have to give them a sense of autonomy that they can make some decisions, man, about what happens to them when they're in these buildings on a day-to-day basis. But in the final analysis, there also has to be competence. They have to be able to read, write, think, analyze, and compute. And we got to do all of those things in a building that's sat in a community that doesn't respect them. (laughs) And you all say, well, how can you say that? I can say that because it's true. I can say that because we're living in a country right now where children can look and see that people in the highest political positions in this country despise them. We live in a country where if you are an immigrant child, your family is afraid to go to church for fear of being deported because we have a a president that has targeted these families and these children. And we can't sit in these conferences eating meals and act like that don't matter because it does. It matters every single day. So I'm asking you to think deeply about how we continue to do this work. I'm asking you all to think not only about how to empower the system, but I'm also asking you to think about how to empower the parents whose kids come to us. Because I believe that we should not have an America where only those of us with money have the ability to choose the best educational environment for our children. I don't believe that we ought to have a country where people teach in schools that they would never put their own children in, demanding that other people's children stay there. And so you can think whatever you want. I'm telling you what I think and why. But I believe that that's all a part of how much do we actually care about these children and their families. If I could just forget for a moment that she's running for president, or was, Marianne Williamson wrote this book, Return to Love, and she talks about the fable of the frog and the princess and how the princess kissed the frog and turned the frog into a prince. And she says this fable is about the miraculous power of love to create the conditions for transformation. Because if you don't love, then you, if you don't love people, you can't understand them. If you can't understand them, you cannot reach them. And if you cannot reach them, how in the world do you think that you can teach them? And people say, oh, are you trying? I gave a speech once in Philadelphia. A lady came up to me, man, and she was like, mad. Are you trying to tell me that I need to love these kids like I do my husband? I was like, first of all, I don't know you. I don't know you and your husband. I don't know how y'all do. (laughs) And and I'm not even talking about romantic love in the first place. I'm talking about agape, unredeeming love, expecting nothing in return. And I believe our children deserve that kind of love. So I want to leave you all with a, a paraphrase by a man named William Daggett. He said, that we must love our children's dreams, their hopes, their prayers, their aspirations, more than we love charter schools, private schools, or district schools. Because in the final analysis, I would argue to you that we must be committed to purpose, not to the institutional arrangements to get to purpose. Because when you begin to get committed to an institutional arrangement rather than to a purpose, that is the day that you become a protector of the status quo. And right now, my friends, the status quo is failing large numbers of our children. God bless you and God bless our children. Thank you very much. Wow.
So before we get started, uh, let me share, uh, I welcome Shelley Parks to the stage, our Missouri Teacher of the Year, and she works. And she works as an English teacher at Francis Howard North High School. So Shelley, thank you for joining us today and thank offering you so us much. your perspective. So my first question is to you. So we just heard from two titans in the field mm -hmm. around issues of ex education and equity. And I'm curious, uh, how do you respond to what you heard from both Michael and from Howard? Yeah, I think my initial reaction is just um, that the dialogue, the rich dialogue in this room and the heart behind the love for kids is so impactful. And my fear is that the things that people see who aren't in this room are the headlines, right? And so then as teachers, we feel deeply about those headlines that say American students are failing because teaching is so personal. And so um, I just, I wish everybody was in the room to hear the additional facets of the dialogue, but thank you. And, and we heard a lot of dialogue today. We heard a lot of passion this morning and, and into this afternoon. And you've traveled across the state of Missouri. I have. And you've seen some of the evidence of some of the promising practices that were shared by both of our speakers. And I'm curious, what, what have you seen that gives you hope uh, that we're on a path towards some success in the future. Yeah, Missouri students are doing great things. I mean, for one example, I read a school in, in our state, the students were commissioned by the Air Force to make a part that cost them $1.50 for a B-2 bomber, and <laughs> it is saving our Air Force $10 billion. That's Missouri students. Wow. Yeah. $10 billion. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So then let me ask you this, as, as I, and I'm asking the whole panel this discussion. So Howard, we listened to the concerns that you shared. We've got to do better as an organization, as a state, as a, as a country, as a world, we have to do better for our kids. And one of the things that you shared as you were talking earlier was how do we make kids feel welcome in their schools? And so I would love for you to share a bit more in, at, at your school how does that look? What does that feel like? Uh, say a bit more, if you will. And then, Shelley, I would love for you to follow up with some examples right. that you may have seen okay. as well. Yeah, you know, I, first of all, I, I, I want people to understand how grateful I am and how much respect I have for people who go into these buildings every day <laughs> and work with these kids. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of us who run around talking who really have no idea what that's really like <laughs> every day single day. And what I would say is that when you come to our school, uh, because it's a small school, number one, we don't have security guards, we don't have metal detectors, we don't have none of that. And I told our kids that the day that we have to have that is the day that the school should shut down. Mm. And especially since they named the school after me. And I told people <laughs> that, if it, <laughs> that if it ever gets to the point where it becomes something else other than a citadel of love for our kids. If I'm not here, I'm going to haunt every single person <laughs> <laughs> that is in the school. And so I do think that there is a way that you can make, feel, make kids feel welcome. Man. It's, it's like how you greet them at the door. Mm -hmm. It's like knowing their names. It's like knowing their backstories. Yes. It's like taking five minutes to ask why are you looking like that today? You know, like, you know, what, you know, what's going on with you? But you can only do that if you actually know the kids. Right, and right. you know that when they look a certain kind of way, there's something going on, right? But sometimes it's not giving them counseling. Sometimes it's just taking five minutes for them to say, you know what, my brother did this to me <laughs> last night and et cetera. So, there are little things that we can yeah. do no, I that I think that. help no, with that. I appreciate that. I, and Shelley, you've probably seen some examples of this. Yeah, I'd here. love yeah. yeah, I'd love to tell you about a story. Um, so Dr. Hostetler is a principal at Francis Hall North where I teach, and we have been talking about honoring dignity of students. And one of the activities that we did is to put up all students' pictures in a hallway of our high school. This was on a professional development day. And we went through as a staff, and we put a check mark if we knew the kid's name, and we put a dot if we knew their story. Mm. And then at the end of that, we saw students who didn't have check marks and didn't have dots, and we said, we've got to be intentional about reaching out to these kids. Mm -hmm. They deserve us to know their story. That's how you honor their dignity. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. And it's a specific data informed right. process mm -hmm. to let you know that you're connecting to all students. Right. 
And I think what we heard implicit and explicit in some of your comments was the importance of parent engagement. Mm -hmm. And so, Michael, I'm wondering, as, as you think about the role parents play yeah. in our reform efforts, uh, Howard mentioned it a bit, uh, you implicitly stated the importance of parent participation. Mm -hmm. What would you offer as some, some uh, suggestions for us as educators on how we engage parents in this process? Oh, I've got a lot of ideas about that <laughs> with, my, uh, with my own two sons. I can only uh, imagine. You can imagine my, the, the poor principal at, at my kid's school. <laughs> Look, I... I I think what we have to remember, and I, and I live it every day, is that it is really hard as a parent. My mm -hmm. kids go to a traditional public school, and it is really hard to feel like you know what's going on or that you have any, a, a, any way to act when you see things that aren't going right. Yeah. Uh, and so whatever you can do as educators to make sure that parents feel like there's an open door uh, and that, that you want their... Uh, you want their input, and mm -hmm. that they probably have good ideas, that they're seeing things that you might not see. Mm -hmm. I also think, look, we, you know, we've had this big shift, as I talked about earlier, in reaching higher to higher standards. And in doing so, when you look at the state tests, we now have defined something like 60 or 70 percent of kids, depending on the state, as being below grade level, as, as not being proficient. Uh, and that lines up with what we see in the national assessment. Now, th that, that's hard news to take, but yeah. what it means is that those kids are not yet on track for graduating from high school and being able to hit the ground running for post-secondary education or, or a good paying job. We need to get them on track. But parents, if you ask parents, is your own child on track? Is your own, grade, is your own child on grade level? You know what percentage of parents will say yes? Nationally, 90%. Wow. 90%. How is that? And I think when you unpack it, you know, it's, it's because, you know, for, for many reasons, they see the test score and maybe they don't put too much, maybe they don't see the test score for one thing, maybe they don't put too much value in it. Maybe they ask their child's teacher, should they put value in this test score? And the teacher says no. Maybe it's because the grades they're seeing are, are maybe a little ele more elevated than they should be. Maybe particularly in, in high poverty schools, we're a little too willing to give kids, you know, a B for trying. Uh, and, and now we've given that parent an indication that their child's doing fine. When really, the parents should know there's an issue. There, there's, they should be concerned. Uh, and we need to talk about how to, how to get uh, this child back on track. So I just think we need to be really thoughtful and aware of, of the messages we're sending to parents and be willing to be courageous. And, and if children are not on track, be willing to tell their parents the truth. I think, you know, talking about parents, though, having been on the other end of being cussed out, I mean, the reality is that sometimes when parents roll up into the building, man, they're not, you know, you're not trying to hear this, man, and, and, and the way they're coming at you. And so the respect for parents is to be respectful when they're not being respectful. And that's real. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and, you know, in a lot of buildings and people come there mad because you done done this to my child. And, but, and, and to be able to, like, negotiate that is 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 something that you know maybe a number of people out here have faced you know particularly people who are are, are school leaders or even teachers so so this this idea of, of not only how to engage parents but more important how do we empower parents nice yeah. and, and 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 how do we deal with parents who are angry and a lot of times cuz i remember one time i got cussed out there's been a number of times i knew for a fact that i was what she was cursing me out about had nothing to do with why she was cursing me out. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Right. It was, it was yeah. I just happened to be the one yep. that day. And what she unloaded on was a whole bunch of stuff that didn't have nothing to do with the issue. It was everything that was going on with her. Uh, but, I, but, but as difficult it was, I took it. And, 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 and we were able to calm it down. But if I'd have gone to it, then the whole thing would have, yeah. you know, exploded. No, I like that distinction you make between involvement of parents and empowerment of parents. And I think that's a, a, a powerful distinction. And this, keep in mind, this is a professional learning conference. So we see professional learning as a vehicle for bringing about those equitable outcomes for our students and those opportunities. Because we believe that if we have powerful teachers in front of every child, and every child has access to that powerful teaching as part of their experience every day, then we start to see some of the positive trends that I think we all want on this stage. So I, a question for all of you, from your perspectives, what do you see as the power of or the opportunities within this conversation around professional learning uh, to support some of the changes that we'd all like to see? 
And Shelly, I'll start with you. Well, I just think teachers need to be encouraged and given opportunities to grow in leadership. A lot of times, um, just I think that teachers, if you want to grow in leadership, it's about getting out of the classroom mm -hmm. instead of growing while you stay in. And so I would like to see teacher leaderships at a systems level be able to help grow teachers who can stay in those classrooms and do the work with kids. Wonderful. Thank you. You know, I, I would say, look, we, we have a moment right now. You, you may have noticed that things in Washington are a little dysfunctional. <laughs> that, that, that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Little so, uh, and, and that is, look, that's happening in many states, too, that our politics are, are pretty dysfunctional right now. The good news about that is that we are not in a mode where policymakers are coming up with brand new policies every other year, mm -hmm. right? And suddenly, this, you know, we have to respond to this move and that move. Things are fairly stable in a lot of places. That gives us an opportunity to finish what we started. And what we started was this shift to the higher standards. The work is around curriculum and around professional learning. It's, it's that intersection. Okay. It's how do we make sure that you've selected a great aligned curriculum right, to the standards, uh, and that you are working day in and day out and helping teachers understand that curriculum better and better. I think, and, and uh, educators I respect think, that if you do that right, you can throw the standards out the window. Mm. Okay, you don't need the standard on the, bo on the board, standard 1475. You don't need to forget the standard, focus on the curriculum. If you've picked mm. a great curriculum and teach that curriculum with passion and with craft, and, and we're off and running. Thank you. You know, I tease a lot of our young teachers because they, you know, all run around calling each other awesome. Hell, everybody ain't awesome. <laughs> you, know I mean? like, you know, a lot of us are just like regular people, right? <laughs> and so, so for me, the issue is how do you get awesome results mm. with regular people? Yeah. And so I think one of the ways of doing that is uh, the, the time that you set aside for professional development. So at our school, every Wednesday afternoon is half day because we do professional development every Wednesday afternoon. Because when I was superintendent, I thought what we passed off as in-service was a hoax. You know, this idea that you get teachers together or twice a semester or some great principal decides we're going to have professional development on Friday afternoon. <laughs> I mean, who comes up with this, man? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so to me, like a part of if we're really going to do professional development is giving teachers consistent time every week to get better at their practice. Because if you don't do that, no, no other profession does professional development like schools. Because people know that that's stupid. You can't bring people together <laughs> like once a semester or you can't send somebody to Utah, and the only way you know they went to Utah was you gotta, you gotta take their class. And then when they come back, there ain't no time for them to, to tell you anything that they learned in Utah. And because whatever they learn in Utah, once they get back and deal with real kids, whatever they learn, there's a problem. And since there was, ain't nobody there to correct that, they go back to doing what they knew, even though it didn't work. So at some point, if we believe people are professionals, we got to treat them like they're professionals and really give them uh, the attention that they deserve. So as we come to the end of our time together, I'm going to ask you all to leave us with a final thought, uh, something that connects to the message that you've shared or something else that you'd like us to leave this room thinking about uh, as it relates to issues of equity and excellence for all of our students. Uh, I'll let you start, Howard, and we'll work our way down. <laughs> no, I, I, I would just say that every single child that we can save is precious because not one of us in this room knows what saving that one child will mean to that child, his or her family, or to the world. Thank you. You can see why I didn't want to follow Howard today. <laughs> Look, uh, I talked a lot about the impact of the Great Recession and poverty. I just want to be clear that uh, even though we know uh, schools can't do it all, you know, and, and that issues outside of schools have a big impact, the question we have to keep asking ourselves is, are schools doing all they can? 
Is my school doing all it can for the kids under our charge? And am I 100% certain that I've got the best curriculum, the most aligned materials, and that I'm providing the support that educators need? Uh, if the answers to those questions aren't yes, we, we've got some more work to do. Thank you. Okay. And Charlotte. Missouri Commissioner Van Dieven said yesterday that we can't have successful schools without successful teachers. And so um, I would urge people to spend time on recruitment and retention of teachers because we've all seen the numbers and they're scary. And every one of our kids, research shows that if our kids are going to achieve, it's a successful, high quality teacher in front of them. So I think we need to invest in teachers. Spend some more time with them. Thank you. Well, First of all, let me just say a couple of things. One, I know we could talk for hours on this provocative conversation, so thank you all. And the other thing I want to say is, I need to borrow both y'all's socks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at these socks, and I'm thinking there's some, some real style, style yeah. sock here. So we'll, chat, we'll talk about that later. But please thank or join me in thanking our speakers today. Thank you so much. Thank you.